straight ahead on IU Newsnet. Almost two weeks after 23 tornadoes touched down, we return to hard hit Sullivan to see how people are piecing their lives back together. And we'll show you the volunteers helping them do it. A student organization is raising awareness about sexual assault. More on the Take Back the Night March and a symbolic art exhibit that makes often unreported crime more visible. Looking for a volunteer opportunity you can take to the bank? Learn more about how you can help clean up the campus river. IU Newsnet starts now. Welcome to IU Newsnet. I'm Evan Gerke. And I'm Lucinda Larnock. A toxic warehouse fire raging for days in Richmond, Indiana is nearly contained, but the smoke is lingering and so is the danger. The fire forced the evacuation of more than 2,000 people and it is uncertain when it will be safe for them to return. The EPA and other health officials are on site to make that call. The thick plumes at plastics recycling plant were, pi were picked up by satellite images from space. After the clock, after around the clock work by firefighters, the smoke is thinning. The EPA has tested for certain toxins like benzene, but have found no traces. However, officials are still concerned about toxic chemicals. Prior to the fire, the owner of the facility was issued citations for multiple violations by the Unsafe House uh, Building Commission. The smoke heads east, evacuees land in Indianapolis for shelter. They said evacuate. I didn't have shoes on, I had socks on, and I left my purse, my shoes. I left a lot of things, personal things, you know, at the house and just got in the car and drove away. Richmond is about 120 miles northeast of us. As of now, the smoke is headed further east and away from Bloomington, but officials are watching to see if it changes directions. Locally, a fire raced through an apartment complex on Bloomington's east side, and the people who live there are looking for a new place to stay. A call came in around 10 Monday night about a fire on the third floor at the Crescent Park Residential Complex. That's near the College Mall. The Bloomington Fire Department says no one was injured, but the fire spread quickly and displaced residents of all 12 apartments. The cause is still under investigation. For now, the former residents are making other living arrangements. A week ago, we told you about extensive damage across Indiana after nearly two dozen tornadoes touched down. Hardest hit was Sullivan, about an hour west of Bloomington. People there are hurting and some have lost everything. But that's where the volunteers come in. IU Newsnet's Liz DeSantis has our follow-up. Liz? Thanks, Evan. First, a quick update on the damage. As you mentioned, the National Weather Service now says 23 tornadoes hit Indiana on the final night of March. I went to Sullivan as soon as the sun rose, and this is what I saw. More than 200 buildings destroyed with streets just unrecognizable. Today, much of that debris is cleared away as thousands of volunteers continue to show their support. Mayor Clint Lamb says that the community is in their quote, honeymoon phase of recovery as hope starts to return to the city. The Red Cross and Salvation Army are pouring volunteer efforts into Sullivan to help the community rebuild. But I went back to find some of the lesser known groups and individuals who say they just want to help. A group of Indiana veterans is doing some heavy lifting to get Sullivan back on track. We, we thrive in chaos as soldiers. And so, you know, we, we get in this and, and we're able to maintain a level head uh, when people are kind of stressed. Stress is something these volunteers know firsthand. Sheepdog Impact Assistance is a national relief organization with more than 25,000 veteran and first responder members, each with his or her own story. We served over in the Middle East, we did a lot of uh, uh, clandestine missions, a lot of reconnaissance things. Working with FEMA, the group responds whenever or wherever they're needed. Arkansas, Mississippi, um, we've done Bahamas, Kentucky, uh, Alabama. Sheepdog's motto? Hashtag get off the couch because uh, we believe that's where people grow. And the organization doesn't only help with human hands. The team often works with cadaver dogs too. He's, he's a golden doodle. His name's Tucker. The organization is all about improving mental health for veterans and retired first responders. So we, we get real well with each other. I mean, we could be uh, 
cutting trees down and stuff and laughing, talking about, hey, you know, when I was in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know, and it just, you, you feel that closeness, that tightness as a group. You know, it changes their mind, it changes their perspective. They're like, you know, I'm sitting at, at the house, you know, I've, I've got a roof over my head, my, my house is warm. And you come out and you see this and you just go, oh, shoot, you know, why, why am I sitting here complaining? You know, these people have it rough. Governor Eric Holcomb declared a state of emergency for Sullivan County after the disaster, making the area eligible for federal funding. But it's still unclear when that funding will be approved. Back to you. Thanks, Liz. In-person classes for K-12 students are canceled for all Monroe County schools today as hundreds of teachers gather at the State House. The annual Pack the House event is drawing even larger crowds than usual this year as teachers rally to protest low wages and teacher shortages. shortages. MCCSC Superintendent Jeff Hauswald says that more than half of the district's teachers requested a substitute instructor for the day. Teachers are writing postcards to legislators to share their thoughts about this session's education agenda. Third grade teacher Kelly Olson says she's concerned some upcoming legislation will be harmful to her students. They want to take a lot of our rights away as educators and I think it's important that we still are able to do what we love to do without having to worry about prosecution or not being able to have a voice in things. The district is holding classes for students as asynchronous e-learning days. MCCSC has had e-learning days before, but never at a district-wide level. April is Sexual Violence Awareness Month. Sexual assaults happen every day of the year, but a student group here on campus wants you to know how to define it and what to do about it. RU Newsnet's Ashley Horner joins us in the studio with the story. Ashley? There have been 40 sexual assaults reported in the IUPD crime log since August. That's 21 reports of rape and 19 reports of sexual battery. But those are just the ones reported on paper. Many go undocumented. Two student-run organizations are stepping up on campus to, pro to protest against sexual violence. I had the chance to see what they are doing. Take a look. Hey, hey, ho, ho, the patriarchy has got to go. The voices of student protesters filled the Take Back the Night March, an effort to put an end to sexual and domestic violence. Stop the violence, no more silence, people fight back. IU Student Government Sexual Violence Prevention and Title IX partnered with Shatter the Silence to host a protest art installation called The Clothesline Project, followed by the march. Well, the message that you're not alone um, can be very powerful and very uplifting for many people who do experience sexual violence on college campuses. People were encouraged to write a message on an item of clothing. The clothesline serves as a testimony to the ongoing crisis of sexual violence. Kate Bangett is the co-president of Shatter the Silence and is a sexual violence survivor. Most of the time we don't even talk about the elephant in the room, but it's just a space where everyone like knows in the back of their hearts like why everyone in the room is or like what they share, but it's just a safe space knowing that like there's other people like you around. According to the CDC, one in four women have experienced completed or attempted rape. Compared to men, just one in 26. After a life-changing experience, there is a new normal. I think a lot of it is relying on your community and that's, I think, one of the big parts of today is like uh, showcasing the community that we have here at IU so that um, no one feels like they are alone. It is unclear who removed the clothesline project. I reached out to IU spokesperson Amanda Roach, but she did not get back with us. Were you able to talk to any survivors? Yeah, I was. I actually got to sit down my camera and actually listen to these survivor stories. And it was honestly just a surreal moment. Like, especially at our age, any one of us could be the, the next victim. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ashley. A revised version of Indiana's Don't Say Gay Bill has passed in the Senate and now awaits approval in the House before it can go to H Governor Holcomb for a signature. House Bill 
A no longer requires parental consent for name or pronoun changes in schools. Instead, it will only require parental notification. Among other things, the bill will also prohibit instruction of human sexuality from pre-K through third grade. This comes just a week after Holcomb signed a bill banning gender-affirming care for minors. IU student and city council candidate David Wolf Bender will not withdraw from the race, he said in a letter to the Monroe County Election Board. Bender has been under investigation from the board after an IDS article alleged Bender did not live in the district he was running in. In the letter, Bender said he has secured a new lease in the district starting May 1st. According to the IDS, Bender is facing two level six felony charges if he knowingly fired, filed to run using false information. When we come back, have you been sniffling and sneezing a bit more than usual? Learn more about why the allergy season is hitting us harder this year. Plus, a crisis condition, conditions at Monroe County Jail. In our ongoing special report, you'll hear about a lack of mental health resources from a man who knows about it firsthand. Stay with us. Welcome back to IU Newsnet. Monroe County has an old, overcrowded jail with sewage and other problems. A lot of people agree it's a problem, but some object to building a new, bigger jail. IU Newsnet's Kayan Tara has spent the semester looking into the issue. She joins us now with the second in a series reports called The Last Appeal. Kayan. A new jail could potentially cost Monroe County up to $50 million. Some believe the money should be funneled into prevention treatment rather than incarceration of people with mental health or substance use disorders. I spoke with a formerly incarcerated person about his experience and what ultimately helped him. Let's take a look. Addiction, mental illness, reincarceration. Several people in jail are trapped in this inescapable cycle of hopelessness. Joseph Thacker knows firsthand. He has been booked into the Monroe County Jail 31 times. His offenses range from impaired driving to possession of illegal substances. And like, it's hard to find a sense of happiness, so you just go back to what you know worked for you, which is getting high or using, and it's just like a very vicious cycle. His story is not unique. A 2021 criminal justice report estimates about 80% of people booked into the Monroe County Jail have a mental illness or substance use disorder. Without treatment, they are constantly in and out of jail. Monroe County's proposed solution is a bigger new jail with 400 beds, a 36% increase from the current facility's capacity. County officials have yet to discuss the cost of a new jail. That money needs to be like freed up and allocated to these different nonprofits that are already successful at this work. Jordan is the director of New Leaf New Life, a nonprofit focused on providing resources for those during and post incarceration. She believes a jail is not conducive to recovery. My assumption is that 99% of people would rather sleep on the street than be even near a jail. The catalyst that turned things around for Joseph? His correspondences with Jordan and others at New Leaf, New Life. That little bit of like hope, you know, that there's somebody out there that cares. Like that goes such a long ways. Joseph says the nonprofit gave him direction practical help, and most importantly, he says, a sense of hope. You know, incarceration can lead to lasting damages for someone's mental health. You know, experts say it can even worsen symptoms. It's absolutely terrible, but tell me, are these issues only specific to Monroe County Jail? Right. Unfortunately, no. It's uh, an issue in a lot of jails around the country, overcrowding, high recidivism, recidivism rates, and, you know, even uh, disintegration of facilities. Next week, actually, I'm going to look at why counties around the country might be battling similar issues. We certainly look forward to hearing more. Thank you. A judge has ruled the former Purdue student incompetent to stand trial on charges. He stabbed his roommate to death. The victim, Varun Manish Cheetah was a senior from Indianapolis in his third year of college and planning to graduate early. The student, Jimu Shah, reportedly had hallucinations, chronic psychosis, 
and delusional thoughts while in jail. Court-appointed medical experts believe that Shah likely suffers from schizophrenia. Court proceedings are delayed for now, and Shah will be committed to the Division of Mental Health and Addiction. Doctors have 90 days to determine Shah's competency for a future trial. A congested and dangerous intersection near campus has been converted from a two-way stop to an all-way stop. Stop signs went in yesterday at the intersection of 7th and Dunn. Drivers and pedestrians heading either direction on 7th will now have to stop at the intersection. Bloomington City Engineer Andrew Cyber signed an emergency mandate bypassing City Council. The mandate will be in effect for 180 days or until City Council approves of the changes. Cyber cited increases in crashes as a reason for installing the stop signs. Have you been near the campus server lately? It's beautiful, right? You can help keep it that way. The IU Office of Sustainability will host the Campus River Litter Cleanup event this weekend. The trash and litter removal takes place every year in celebration of Earth Month. Since the Campus River feeds directly into the White River, keeping it clean helps both the campus and the surrounding community. I feel like littering in the rivers on campus is so stupid. There's trash cans all over campus. Just throw your trash away. It's not that hard and you're literally messing up our environment. We're already going through so much, so just don't make it worse. The cleanup event will take place rain or shine from 10 to noon tomorrow. Cleanup crews will gather near Eagleson Avenue and work their way to Dunn Meadow. This week, it's been 70 degrees and sunny, signaling that spring is certainly in the air in Bloomington. But so is lots and lots of pollen. Our reporter, Lucy Kellison, shows us why sneezing is the sound of spring in Indiana. Indiana University's annual spring landscaping is in full bloom. It makes for some fresh flowers, new mulch, and some bright green grass. But for some students, it brings something else. <laughs> when it comes to taking a punch from pollen, IU junior Michelle O'Brien is no exception. Yes, they're, they're only in the springtime. Um, seasonal, yeah, it's awful. And being surrounded by nature in Bloomington isn't helping her case. I've noticed it being like significantly worse here than it is at home. And like just like all the landscaping, like where all the flowers are, like IMU area, Sample Gates, it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be bad there. O'Brien claims that on top of taking three daily allergy medications, she has a new line of defense. I have this app and it tells me the pollen count of every day. It's based on a scale of 12. Today's 11.7. Like if you have allergies, like you're like gonna suffer today. If you're anything like Michelle, IU's got your back and your sinuses. Just go to any of the six IU vending machines located around campus for cold, flu, and allergy relief. During this week's Ask Aaron webinar, viewers were able to get some insight into what's causing the sniffling. Allergies are an issue when your body mistakes something that's generally harmless for something that's, that, that, that your body thinks is harmful and therefore mounts an attack. With warm temperatures rising and spring flowers blooming, it's important to set yourself up for the attack. For IU Newsnet, I'm Lucy Kellison. Welcome back to IU Newsnet. We have Catherine Hawkins joining us in studio for sports. Catherine, what an exciting draft for fans of the IU women's basketball team. Yes, and Grace is staying close by. Let's get into it. Grace Berger made history this week, and Hoosier fans are incredibly excited. Berger was drafted by the Indiana Fever at 7th overall in the WNBA draft on Monday. The Indiana women's basketball guard become the program's highest ever draft pick. The winningest player in Indiana history said she grew up watching the Fever and is excited to see women's basketball continue to grow in the state. If you're looking to support Berger, the Fever are already selling her number 34 jersey through the Pacers team store. IU basketball just scored itself a new player for the upcoming season. Kellel Ware, who played for University of Oregon, announced he was committing to the Hoosiers on Monday. The soon-to-be sophomore is going to bring an edge to IU's team as he comes in at 7 foot and is a 5-star player. The top 10 recruit averaged 6.6 .6 points during his freshman year with a 4.1 point rebound average. Not only that, but Ware was selected the McDonald's All-American and ranked number 8 in the ESPN 100 for 2022. It will be an exciting addition for the team, and you'll be able to see Ware alongside the Hoosier team for their first game back in the fall. The sport of soccer is always a battle, and it looks like the Hoosiers have formed an army. 
The Hoosier Army roster is made up of IU men's soccer alumni, most of whom competed in NCAA championships for IU. They announced they will be competing in the newest championship soccer tournament called TST. The soccer tournament is a 32-team World Cup-style bracket with a winner-takes-all prize of $1 million. It will feature a 7v7 format and host teams from across the world. The Hoosier Army will be led by the current associate head coach of the IU men's program, Kevin Robson. 2018 IU grad Austin Pancho says the tournament truly will be a battle. We're going to be facing off against some of the best teams in the world between um, Borussia Dortmund, um, of course, um, Nacaxa from Mexico, all these different teams from all over are going to be joining to fight for the million dollars. So can't wait to uh, to represent the Hoosiers again and get the band back together. And I'm very excited to uh, see how well we can do. TST will take place in North Carolina in June. Tune in to any major sports channel to watch the Hoosier Army go into battle. IU baseball is in full swing this April with the Hoosiers sitting 23-10 after their win against Ball State on Tuesday. The Hoosiers defeated Ball State's Cardinals with a handful of great plays, but it was first baseman Brock Tibbetts, a sophomore, who helped bring home the win. The game saw Tibbetts score five RBIs after he didn't hit any in the game against Iowa on Sunday. With the home runs and strong play from IU, the team are now in the top 20 for D1 baseball and the only Big Ten team in the rankings. Indiana will head up north to play a three-game set against Illinois on Friday and hopefully bring back another win. As Indiana University's staple event, the Little 500 is getting closer each day. There is one huge change for this year's race. Our Evan Kamiko has more on what to expect on the track next week. One major change to the Little 500 race has riders on new bikes for the 35th and 72nd running of the race. For the last four years, riders have been on Schwinn bikes, but will now be transitioning to state bikes. I feel like it does have a little bit more kick to it, which um, I do enjoy. The bikes, it's a little bit thinner, um, but I think once we find the right parts, I'll be a little bit more comfortable on the bike. Um, the state bikes are stiffer, um, so it's a better transfer of power, so I feel like it's a quicker bike. It's more stable in the turns, uh, you're not sliding out as much. Being that on race day, every single team is going to be riding on the same bikes. What the actual race is going to come down to is the adjustments each team makes on their specific bikes. Look at the wheels. Like This year you can go deeper in depth, so you can kind of pick if you want a deeper rim, which will be faster when you're up to speed, but heavier, um, so it's harder to get up to speed. And then you can go also go uh, non-deep dish and go wider, so it's more stable in turns. In years past, we've always upgraded our bikes, changing out parts, such as our crank, our wheels, our chain. Um, and now with these new state bikes, we have to figure out all new parts. I actually have to consult with my coach and figure out what would be the best for that. Overall, it's a single speed fixed gear bike um, and you're still riding on cinders. So, you know, the, the variables are still there and uh, it certainly it certainly affects it. Now the attention turns to whose strategy will benefit the most when the Little 500 gets underway. From Bill Armstrong Stadium, Evan Camico, IU Newsnet. In seven days, fans get to see the state bikes live in action for the first time. The women's race is at 4 next Friday afternoon, and the men's is at 2 on Saturday afternoon. And finally, the IU men's golf team took part in the Hoosier Collegiate Invitational last week, playing against other colleges across the country. The Hoosiers placed second, right behind the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. The team will play their final game of the season away in Illinois at the Fighting Illini Collegiate Tournament. And that's it for sports. Yeah, I just have to say, I'm really excited to see those new little five bikes in action. Thanks, Catherine. One more thing before we go. An organization on campus is saving lives and it only takes them five minutes at a time. Gift of Life at IU is part of a national organization that keeps a registry of possible matches for bone marrow and blood donations. This week, they set up tables for people to complete a five minute cheek swab and survey to join the database. Next week, we'll give you a more in-depth look at the organization. And if you haven't joined the registry yet, don't worry. You can take five minutes to sign up tomorrow at their table across from Hodge Hall on 10th and Fee. That's it for IU's Newsnet for now. We have a behind the scenes student production team in the control room and working in the studio for this broadcast. We thank them and we thank you for watching. I'm Evan Gerke. And I'm Lucinda Larnick. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at IU Newsnet. Take care, stay safe, and we'll see you next week.